All right, so chapter 10, property, plant, and equipment. The acquisition um, and disposition of, of property, plant, and equipment. So when you talk about property, plant, and equipment, we're talking about a whole plethora of different items. Uh, this is what we're going to focus on today. We're talking about the acquisition costs that go into land, land improvements, buildings, equipment. And we're going to talk about how interest costs fit into that, into that equation. Um, so we're going to figure out how to value our purchases. We're going to talk about what happens when you incur costs subsequent to acquisition and ultimately when you dispose of your fixed assets. Okay? Um, so we're going to start off with land. And can anyone tell me, when you're talking about land, do we, talk, do we, are, do we also talk about depreciation? No. no. Land is a fixed asset, but it does not depreciate. So it's generally classified as property, plant, and equipment, um, but it does not depreciate. Okay? So here, it's important when I say it's generally classified as property, plant, and equipment. This is land that you're using in operations, okay? Um, so not land that you're holding for some other purpose to sell or something like that. It's not an investment here we're talking about a property, plant, and equipment. Okay. So costs include, um, there's a whole list of things here, and I, what I just want to kind of, before we get into like this whole ridiculous list, what happens is when you purchase a property, and, and this is going to sort of help us through the lesson, when you purchase a property, um, you have a closing statement. Okay. And on that closing statement, um, you have things, you have all sorts of fees, okay? You have, you know, the, the, the attorney will put their fee on this closing statement. They'll, the purchase price will be on there. Any recording fees, title fees, commissions for our brokers and things. Sometimes you buy a property and you buy it um, on the 15th of the month and there are taxes due on the 30th, but you only owe it for 15 days. So the amount of taxes are, you know, that you will owe related to the property or that, they owe, that, or that the seller owes you, because you're going to have to pay the full taxes at the end of the month, that's all factored into the sale, okay? So this happens whether or not you buy a commercial property or a residential property, all right? I've seen this a lot with commercial properties. So it's basically one big journal entry. Who, you know, what's the purchase price? And it figures down and you have all these different fees broken down and, and what the buyer owes and what the seller owes. And essentially you have to record this as a journal entry on your books. Okay? So what happens is all of these fees become part of uh, the purchase price. Okay? This becomes part of what you would record the land at. Um, so there's often building, not just land, and we'll get into that allocation in a little while. But essentially when you buy property, you have lots of fees that you pay along with it. Those fees are going to be included in the price of that property. Um, now, other things <clears throat> that get the property ready for its intended purpose are also going to be included in the cost of that land. So I'm talking first broadly, you buy a property, you have lots of fees that are on that closing statement, that's all going to be recorded. It's one big a closing statement, if you ever work in real estate, is one big journal entry. You have to make that journal entry, you're going to record it all into between, you have to allocate between land and building and we're going to, like I said, we'll talk about that later. But there's also other, fee, other things that will happen. For example, to get land ready for, you, for its intended use, you may have to remove an old building. Okay? That also would go into the cost of the land. Okay? So anything to get that land ready for its intended use. I have here draining, filling, clearing. Okay? Um, so you have this, the fees, and then you have these other costs to get it ready for its intended use. Okay? And that's all going to be incorporated into the price. Yes? Yes, the, like, uh, exactly. I was going to say a HUD form, but I didn't think anyone would really know what that is. But yeah, HUD-1 form. Um, you're really talking, this is like, this is the closing statement. Okay? So, um, there are a couple of other things we need to incorporate here. When you talk about land, you have, sometimes what happens is, you have proceeds from, from these salvage materials. So, I can tell you, um, some people buy property, okay? And they buy it for the stuff that's inside. Like some people sell property and it has, you ever, like copper piping. You ever hear like people stealing copper piping and things like that? And you're like, who wants that? It, you know, why would you do that? There's value a lot of times in things that, um, that the seller may not, you know, may either incorporate into the price or not. But the buyer may buy that property knowing that there's value in these salvage materials. Okay, so they might buy, might buy a property, a buyer might buy a property and be able to sell materials that are inside that 
that, uh, that property. So the proceeds from that sale will reduce the price of the land, okay? If, there's, if there are salvage materials, okay? So there are things that add to it and there are things that reduce the price. Um, if you make permanent improvements to the, la to the land, then those are also going to add to the price of what the value of the land is that you're going to record it at. So if you have, you know, if you add sewers or drainage that the government requires that you add upon purchase, okay, you can add that to the price of your land. If you have some kind of permanent landscaping that you put in that doesn't have a useful life, that would also add to the price of your land. Separately from that, <clears throat> um, you may have things like land improvements. We're going to do a quick brief exercise, but I just want to mention. So um, sometimes you may add a driveway, for example, to the land. A driveway has a limited, has a useful life. At some point, that driveway may need to be repaved. Okay. So driveways, whereas they look like they're maybe, you know, is that really part of my land? There are some things that you add to land that have limited lives. Those things are called land improvements, and they do depreciate, okay? So the, the difference, you add things to land that do not have a useful life. If there's something, if some improvement that you make to your land that actually does have a limited life, you have to put that as a land improvement and depreciate it accordingly, okay? So it depends upon the type of improvement that you're referring to. Okay, so just to start off, very basic, look at brief exercise 10-1. It's a very, very brief, brief exercise. <laughs> so we're looking at what goes into the price of land. Brief exercise 10-1. Ten dash one. Brief exercise ten dash one. Okay. We also have things like land improvements. I gave you driveways as an example. Fences would might be very commonly put up. These are these would generally be classified as land improvements because they have they have useful lives that um, are not indefinite. Okay. They will depreciate over time and have to be replaced at some point. Okay, so these would be recorded as capital, they would be recorded, uh, you know, as, as some kind of capital asset, okay, as property, plant, and equipment. However, they wouldn't be recorded in the land account because they have useful lives. Land does not depreciate. Okay, you also have buildings that you purchase. So realistically, I just talked about land in, on a closing statement. Sometimes companies just buy land, but very frequently companies also buy land with building on it, and like I said, we're going to be talking a little bit later about um, the allocation between land and building, but right now also I just want to kind of mention, so a building, any warehouse, any office building, you know, any structure um, that is not, that's sitting on land is a building, okay? So just similarly to the way you would record land, you have to record the purchase price, any fees, commissions, any costs that go into, uh, you know, uh, getting that building ready for use, the same idea, okay, would be incorporated into the cost of the building. And I feel like a lot of this is really quite logical, okay. Um, you're going to put reasonable costs, and we're going to talk about, again, some costs are repairs and are not going to go necessarily into the, co the cost of that asset. They will ultimately be expensed. But anything that's getting that, that asset ready for use, anything that's going to extend the life of that asset is going to be considered part of the cost of that asset. Okay? So take a look again now. We're going to look at uh, exercise 10-2, E-10-2, exercise 10-2. Exercise 10-2 is going to take us through the allocation of cost between land and building. So when you allocate between land and building, these are, this is how you split the costs up. So I'll just kind of, I'm going to put this up and then I'm going to point to some things that I, um, that I think are very important. And then if you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to address those. So um, as I said, the cost of your property includes anything that's on that closing statement. Okay? So things on that closing statement, legal fees. Um, 
Title insurance. You're always going to see these, these items. Title insurance is something that is insurance that you purchase for a closing. Okay? It's the idea is that you're buying something. Do you have clean title? Right? So you have to buy title insurance. This all goes along with the, with the purchase of a property. Okay? So all these kinds of items, it, it's at the property level, so it's allocated to land. Now, a couple of people asked a really great question about liability insurance. It says liability insurance during construction. So normally, insurance, is insurance capitalized normally? I should ask you that. No, you have an insurance expense account. The only time you have it as like an asset is really when it's prepaid, and then you expense it as you use it up. So we're going to be getting into this very shortly, and I think this is probably, like I said, one of the most important pieces of this chapter is the concept of, of capitalizing interest and capitalizing cost during construction. Okay? So what happens is the FASB takes this position that if you have, if you buy a property and you take out a loan to fix that property up to get it ready for use, then the interest that you incur on that loan is capitalized as part of the cost of that asset during the construction period. Okay? So, for example, when I worked out west in that, at this movie studio, this was, a prop, this was a big project. It was actually an old, um, it was an old Boeing NASA facility. It had gigantic warehouses on it. There were like replicas of space shuttles built here. And it was a wonderful space to film movies because it was so big. So, um, the problem was is that in the state that it was in, it wasn't really necessarily usable as a movie studio. So, we had a loan, a large loan that we took out. And there were different buildings, and some of the buildings were placed in service, and some of the buildings weren't. So we had to figure out what portion of the loan related to that, the buildings that were not yet placed in service, okay, because they were not usable as a movie studio. They were not, they were, we were still getting them ready for their intended purpose. We had to clean them, we had to paint them and soundproof them and all these sorts of things to get them so when movies came in and wanted to film, they could use them right away, okay? So in doing this, we had to allocate the portion of our loan that we thought was related, was related to, that, to that building not yet placed in service, and we capitalized that interest as part of the cost of our purchase. Our purchase, our purchase price went up every period by those interest costs. The, p the piece of the loan that we determined was related to the rest of the property that was already in use was expensed. Okay, so you have to take, the, you, the FASB takes the position, again, you could have avoided that interest cost if you weren't getting this ready for its intended use. Okay, so that interest becomes capitalized during the period and things like insurance and other items related to the construction period also become uh, capitalized. Okay, because you wouldn't have incurred them if you weren't getting that, that property ready for its use. Make sense? Okay. Um, and then other things like, you know, salvage materials obviously reduce the cost of that land, which we talked about. Okay. Any questions on exercise 10-2? Any other questions besides for the things I specifically addressed? Okay. So moving along. So then, so we've gone through land, we've gone through building. Let's talk about br very briefly about equipment. There's no surprises here. Um, so when we talk about equipment, we're talking about assets that are used in operations. So it, I write here, not from their resale value. Uh, because sometimes you sell assets at a gain or at a loss, but that's not specifically why you have that asset. You don't buy it to sell it. If you bought something to sell it, what would it be called? Inventory. Okay. So this again, you want to make sure you can always distinguish between what you buy to operate and what you buy to resell. Okay. You might end up selling equipment or selling a building or selling land at a gain or loss, but that's not its intended purpose. You didn't buy it just to sell it. <clears throat> so the purchase, the, the, the cost includes all expenditures necessary to get the asset ready for use. You see a pattern here? Okay, with all of these assets, it's anything that gets it ready for its intended use, plus all these closing costs, minus salvage value for items uh, related, you know, that you're able to get money back. Um, from stuff within that property. So this can include taxes, transportation, installation, testing, trial runs, reconditioning. And if you get any discounts on that, it would reduce the cost. Yes? So if you have a large piece of equipment that has to be assembled, would you add the cost of labor to the 
Yes. Well, we're going to, and it's funny, we're going to talk a bit about la direct labor, yes, for sure. Okay, direct labor, direct materials, and then there's the allocation of overhead, right? And, and you, when you take cost accounting, you'll learn about that. But yes, absolutely, those, those costs would figure into getting it ready for its intended use. Um, there are, um, it's not always easy to allocate these indirect costs, this overhead, which is, like I said, what we're going to be talking about a little bit further, you know, down the line in this, in this chapter. Okay. Um, but yes, you do, you do incorporate that. Okay. Um, so sometimes when we purchase property, we purchase land, building, equipment, we make improvements. Sometimes we do this um, for cash and sometimes we do this in some way that we exchange one thing for another thing. Okay. We exchange something for our property rather than cash, other than cash. So can anyone think of something what you might exchange other than cash? Stock is a great example, right? So sometimes small companies, when they start up, they don't have anything to offer but stock. So they'll want to buy something and in exchange give stock, okay? Um, something else you might exchange. Hmm? Any ideas? Debt, Debt could be something. Well, if you, 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 you would incur debt, right, you could take out loans, right? I'm thinking of something even more basic. Just other assets, yeah. You can say, um, I'll sell you some of the inventory that I have on hand if you sell me this piece of equipment that I need. Okay, you may have something that they want, they may have something that you want. Okay, so you can, some companies will exchange assets, some companies will exchange stock. So when this happens, when you have a non-cash acquisition, you're going to value that asset at the fair value of what you give or what you receive, whichever is clearer. Okay, so if you make, an ex if you make some kind of a non-cash acquisition, you have to recognize that you're going to record the, what you receive okay, at whatever you've given up or whatever you receive, whichever is clearer. So here I write, you can ex issue stock in exchange for assets when a company is forming. That's the example we just talked about. And also, I wrote, you can exchange inventory for a car. It just depends upon, um, you know, depends upon the circumstances. This may, this, you know, may happen. Okay? <clears throat> so... Again, this is just more of the same. You can exchange securities in exchange for an asset. I, or, we already said that, okay? And I, we already also said that usually occurs when small companies are incorporating, they'll exchange stock for some assets that they need, okay? And again, the same idea, you value the assets at the fair value of the securities that you give or the fair value of the assets you receive, whichever is clear. It's the same thing. I'm just stating it in a different way. Okay, sometimes you need an appraisal to figure that out. Okay, sometimes you don't know what the value of your stock is, or you don't know necessarily what the value of that asset is, you have to get an appraisal. Okay. Um, so let's take a look. Exercise 10-3. Exercise 10-3 is just going to walk us through the purchase of some equipment um, that's purchased for in different ways. And uh, we have to figure out how to record that. How do we journalize these? These, uh, these purchases, okay? Absolutely. Okay, so E103, exercise 10-3. Um, okay, so the first one is pretty simple. It's just what the consideration is that you exchange, okay? The second one gives you um, they tell you that you pay a down payment of $2,000 and all, I mean, the best advice I can give you when you're thinking about transactions happening, these are things that you may do in your life, right? You go in and you say, well, I'm going to give a down payment, I'll take out a loan for the rest, okay? So if you're going to pay back a certain, if you're going to be paying back $18,000 in the future, do you have to have $18,000 in the bank today to pay that back in the future? No. So they're really accepting some lower overall consideration. So you take the present value of that 18000 they tell you the prevailing rate of interest is 10%, and it's for one year. 
So it becomes 16364 plus you gave 2000 down. So what you're really paying is 18364 Okay? At the same time, you have, to, you have a note payable you have to put on your books for 18000 You just have cash going out of 2000 It balances with a discount on the note. Okay? This is kind of a standard, you know, you, you'll see, you see, we see things like this a lot happening in this class in, in various contexts. Okay, notes receivable, here's a note payable. <clears throat> in the next scenario, you're, you have inventory, okay, um, that you, you have inventory that is on your books at 12000 that you would normally sell for 15200 Okay, in this context, this is the clearer, this is really what your, um, this is the clearer of the two prices. Okay, so it's on your books at the 15.2. If they use the periodic inventory, because um, so then you're not recording the cost of goods sold, so you're not taking it out of inventory at the time, right? Then you would just make right. You would have, no, you wouldn't even, you would just take it off your books at the end of the period, right? Because you have, you would record the cost of goods sold at the end of the period. So that's a good question, right? Because you would eliminate this middle section here, right? Because you don't, you don't record that cost of goods sold and that inventory going out. Okay? Um, and in the last case here, we have stock that we issue. Okay, it's just kind of highlighting these are different ways that companies may go about purchasing something. You may, you may come across these scenarios for whatever company you end up working for. Okay, sometimes exchanges happen. You may see transactions like this that clients do. Okay. And again, you may be more likely to see things like this in smaller businesses where they're starting up. They don't necessarily have the cash on hand, but they, they make, you make deals, right? I have something that you want. You have something that I want. Let's exchange or I'll issue you stock. Okay, so the question is how to value that. Yes. Because the prevailing rate of interest is 10%. Right? If you were to put money into a bank, the idea is that if somebody, if you say to somebody, I'm going to pay you $18,000 in a year, what do you have now? Right? And, and how is it going to get to that $18,000? It's going to get there because you have it in some bank account where the prevailing rate of interest is some amount. Okay, and so it says, right, that like the prevailing rate of interest, does it say something to that effect? 8% they're dead. They're just telling you that maybe, maybe what the, what's the, is it a dealership? Let me look. Um, yeah, the... Yeah, ten percent is the prevailing rate of interest. Sometimes, like you can go to a dealership and they can give you some, like they can say, you know, you could finance something at 0.9 percent or one point. You know, they have different percentages that they may deal with. That is is just for that, you know, just in that auto industry, okay? Or that they have some deal to get you to come in and, and borrow, okay? Um, that's not really the real borrowing rate. The real borrowing rate is what you'd have to borrow from a bank at, okay? So that ten percent is is the is really the prevailing rate. Yes? When, 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 when would we use the 8%? Um, you wouldn't unless you took out a loan from the car dealership. Okay? Uh, you see what I'm saying? Like, if, if you go to, if I was to go to a car dealership, there's, if I need to take out a loan for a car, okay, there's multiple ways I can do that. I mean, this is, you know, I could, I could go to a bank and take out a loan from a bank or I can go to the car dealership and car dealerships often have deals where they have like better rates of interest to try to bring you in to, to entice you to buy the car. Okay, so the only way you'd write out, you would use that rate of interest is if you take out a loan from that, from that car dealership for the car. Okay? Make sense? Good. All right, so let's move on from this um, to self-constructed assets. So now we're going to get into this discussion of interest capitalization. Okay? Um, so we have... This problem, again, we're constructing an asset, and I've sort of started discussing this already in the context of one of the problems we did. But sometimes you are constructing an asset, and you have to figure out what are the costs of constructing that asset. So 
The first issue, which both of these issues have come up, which is great because it just shows you guys are thinking ahead. So how much in terms of manufacturing costs should be allocated to the construction? So, and really we're talking about indirect costs here. So how much overhead should be allocated to that construction? That's the first question. So if I'm constructing, if I'm constructing um, a property and I am sitting doing the accounting for that property in, a, um, in an office where we pay rent on a monthly basis, okay, is that rent different depend, you know, regardless of whether or not we're constructing that building? I'm still sitting there, but some of my time is now being spent dealing with the accounting for this construction process. Okay? So this is one of the issues. There are like these fixed overhead costs that um, are incurred regardless of whether or not you're constructing that asset, but yet I'm spending my time getting that asset ready for its use by doing the work that I'm doing in that office. So I may be paying rent. Okay? There are other things where you may have overhead costs where, where you have um, electric. Okay? Electric is going to, is your electric bill going to go up if you're constructing an asset and you're plugging in more equipment to construct that asset? But that electric bill, so it is going to go up, right? Because you are constructing an asset. But you may have an electric bill that's also for your office space and all sorts of things. So you have these costs that incrementally go up that are overhead, like, a, like power. And then you have costs that are fixed, like you know, my salary or the rent uh, for the space that I sit in doing the accounting work that I do. So the question is, when you're constructing an asset, some of those costs really are related to constructing that asset because power is going up and some of my time is being spent um, doing the accounting. Okay? So the first issue is how much should we allocate to construction? Okay, these, these, this is the first issue. The second issue is how should we treat interest during construction, interest costs incurred during construction? Okay? So these are the two issues. When you're trying to figure out how much an asset costs you to construct, these are the two issues that come about, okay? Because there are, there are basic things. What happens is companies, <coughs> so companies construct assets, and what they, what they often do is they take out loans to construct these assets. And what happens is, um, what we're used to seeing in our, maybe in, in the, you know, our daily lives, so to speak, so you may think, I want to buy a house in the future, and I want to take out a loan, I'm going to use that loan to buy that house. What, biz, what companies often do that are constructing assets is they have, they take out loans from, from a bank initially to purchase a property. And then what they do is they take out what are called loan draws. Okay? So they may say, um, you know, I need $12 million to buy this property, but the loan may go up to $100 million. Okay? And every month you, you construct that asset, and every month you take those, the, the bills that you get from, for, from the um, contractors, and you submit them to the bank, and the bank gives you a big check, and then you pay your bills. Okay? And so your loan goes up over time. Okay? Those costs, the basic costs, the bills that you get from the contractor are very simple. Those increase the price of that property, of constructing that asset. Okay? But then you have other things, like people's time being spent, that are not necessarily going directly through the loan draw. Okay? And you have like power bills and things like that these also may need to be incorporated into the price of that asset. Does that make sense? So you have direct bills that you submit to, say, the lender to get you know, a, a check for to then repay the, the um, contractors. But then you have these other things. Okay? And then as you, as you incur those costs, as you take out loan draws, what happens to your loan balance? It goes up. And therefore, what happens to your monthly loan interest payment? Goes up. Okay? So the question is, how do, how do you account for the interest related to those, to those uh, increased loan payments? Okay? So the construction costs obviously will include materials and direct labor. These are going to be things like the bills that you submit for your loan draws on a monthly basis. Okay? Um, because very frequently, you can, you can be constructing your own asset, but very often you'll hire somebody. You buy a property and you hire somebody to do it for you. So they're going to bill you every month for the materials and the labor that they incur. Right? So that all goes into your cost of construction. That's direct cost. So the question is, again, how to allocate the overhead between normal production and the project. <clears throat> so we have a gap approach and a non-gap approach to that. 
So this is the straightforward piece. This is the not so straightforward piece. So one is you would isolate, I think power is a great example, right? You would, you would increase, you would only allocate the increase in your power bill every month to that project. You would say that power bill went up because over our average power bill cost because we're, con we're constructing this, we're constructing a building, okay? And the equipment is using more power. So that's one possibility. And then you would just not allocate the fixed overhead. You would say, you know what? Forget the rent on that building. It's like, you know, it's there anyway. We're not really incrementally incurring any cost, so we're not going to allocate any fixed overhead. That is not GAAP. Okay, GAAP requires that you allocate a portion of the fixed and a portion of the variable. Um, and you'll learn more about this in your cost accounting class. So GAAP requires that we use what's called a full cost approach. So we have to allocate, we use a cost driver, okay, and we allocate fixed costs and variable costs, fixed overhead and variable overhead according to some cost driver. I could get into a whole bunch of detail with that, this, but I'm going to just keep it really simple. Just know that if you are using GAAP, according to GAAP, you have to use what's called a full cost approach, which means you have to allocate direct materials, direct labor, and overhead that's both fixed and variable. That's what's important for you to understand for this purpose, okay? So you have to use what's called a full cost approach, which incorporates direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. What two types? Fixed and variable overhead have to be added to the price of that asset. Direct labor hours, yeah, direct labor. You can use, there are a whole bunch of different cost drivers, but direct labor is a very common one. The more labor hours you work, the more costs are probably incurred, the more power you're using, the more I'm probably spending my time in the accounting office, you know, working on this project, right? So that's the idea. That tends, direct labor tends to drive costs up, okay? A method of allocating overhead. So what's important here, again, is that you have to understand in your cost of construction for a self-constructed asset to accurately figure out what the price of that asset's going to be, what the, what the, you know, what, what's going to be on your books for that asset. So if you're constructing a building, you have materials that go into that building, you have labor that goes into constructing that building, but then you also have these overhead costs. And your, the price of that building is not going to be accurate unless you incorporate those variable costs and those fixed costs that you incur. Okay? So that's the first issue. The second issue is interest capitalization, as I said. So again, the idea is, and I've said this before, the total cost should reflect the company's total investment in, the, in that asset. So what, what's the total that you invested in that asset? The cost on the book should reflect that total investment. Because the idea is that if you, so that building that, in that movie studio, studio that I worked in, okay? That building that was not yet placed in service, was it, was it earning any revenue for us? And what's the idea behind capitalizing and depreciating things? What's the idea behind it? What principle are we talking about? What is it? Matching, matching principle, right? And what does the matching principle say? We have to match the expenses with the related revenue, right? So it, that building that we, per, that, you know, this property that we purchased, part of it was placed in service and Every month when we paid our mortgage, we were also earning revenue because we were renting out that space for movies, okay? So we're matching for the part placed in service, very simply. We're matching the mortgage payment with the revenue. So there's an expense related to revenue every month. What about the part of the building that was not placed in service? Is it, it's not earning revenue, right? So it, should, we, should we have any expense there? Should we, have, should we be expensing the mortgage interest related to that building if there's no revenue related to it? No, we have to match it in the future when it's placed in service. When it's earning revenue, then we should be expensing things. So the idea is we capitalize all of the items related to that building, okay, that we're constructing. We capitalize all the costs, but we don't depreciate it. We wait and we start depreciating it once it's placed in service and it's earning money for us. Okay, so it satisfies the matching principle. So I hope that starts to make more sense. So again, so part of that is interest costs. So instead of expensing those interest costs, the idea is we are going to expense in the future when we benefit from that building. 
Does anyone have, have a question on that concept? As I, can, I will explain it again. I think that concept might, can be confusing, but if you think about it, you're trying to satisfy the matching principle. So you say, normally I have a mortgage bill I'm going to get every month and I, ha I really have to pay it. Normally I would expense it because I have this property that's part of my operations and it's helping me earn revenue. But now it's just being constructed. It's not earning me any revenue. So we have to kind of put everything on hold. It's like time out. Just capitalize everything related to it. Interest and everything. Just capitalize everything and then expense it once it's placed in service. Okay? So we capitalize. Interest is one of those things that we capitalize. So um, again, only, you only capitalize the interest on assets that are constructed as discrete projects. Okay? So any project that you're working on, so if you, so a great example again is this property. It was an 80-acre site. It had multiple buildings. Some of them were placed in service. We didn't capitalize that interest. We only capitalized the interest on the building that was being constructed, that was not yet placed in service. Okay? And we did that, we did that only over the period that it was being constructed. <clears throat> you only capitalize interest during the construction period. I've said that. And again, here, I'll, it just says the same thing. It satisfies the matching principle. Okay? You're going to depreciate later when the asset is providing benefits for you. Okay? An asset is a resource of the firm that's going to benefit the firm in the future. So that building is a resource that's going to benefit you in the future. It's going to help provide you revenue. So you'll, you expense when it's actually placed in service and you're doing that. So getting a little further into this now. Oh, you need me to keep it there another minute? So this is very common too. If you work in real estate, you'll end up seeing things where you have, um, you'll end up seeing property where you, you buy a large property. You know, you, you, in, in real estate industry, it's not always like you don't always buy something that's like one building. You buy property that has multiple buildings on it and, and some of it is being constructed, some of it's working for you. So this is, this is not an uncommon scenario where you have interest capitalization. Now what we're going to get into is how you do this. Okay? It's how you capitalize this interest. So again, it begins, the capitalization period is when construction begins and you make the first expenditure. Okay? Simple. So what do you do here? So you capitalize the portion of the interest that could have been avoided if you had not been constructing that asset. Okay? So if, you're, if you start your initial loan and it's giving you $10,000 of interest every month and then you start doing construction, you take out loan draws, okay? and now your interest is going up to $12,000, $13,000, $14,000. Anything over that $10,000 could have been avoided if you weren't doing construction. Okay? So that's the portion that gets capitalized. Is anything that could have been avoided if the expenditure had not been made. <clears throat> the idea is, is, again, if there was no project, then you'd have no debt, so you determine interest based upon what you spend. So we're going to now get into this a little bit more. It's something called weighted average accumulated expenditures. So what happens is, this is much simpler than it sounds. So in any given year, do you take out one loan draw, you know, do you do construction on one period, get one bill, and then that's it, and it's outstanding the whole year? Wouldn't that be simple, right? But that's not reality, right? The reality is you do work over the course of a year. So for one month, you have $100,000 in loan draws. The second month, you take out another 100000 Now you have 200000 The following, you know, then you don't do anything for a couple of months, and you have bills, and you incur more costs. So what you have to do is figure out what's the average that I spent over the year. Okay, you have to figure out that amount. What's the average debt that I incurred during the year? That's called your weighted average accumulated expenditures. So you figure out how much was spent during the period to construct the asset. That was the average that you accumulated. And then you figure out the interest rate that was in effect during that same time period. Okay, so let's see what that means here as an example. So let's say as of, on January 1st, I, as of January 1st, I incurred $300,000. In, in, in expenditures that I, I put through my loan. My loan's going to now go up by 300000 So for 12 out of 12 months, I have $300,000 of debt from this construction. Okay? 
And then this is a very simple loan. So in July, I take out another loan draw for another 400000 okay, um, for more bills. And so for six out of 12 months, I have 400000 outstanding, which means really 200000 on average for the year. So my average accumulated expenditures for the year is 500000 because some of it was outstanding for the whole year, some of it was outstanding for only six months, and this can be go on and on and on. This, you could do this every single month. This is a very simple example. Okay, what's my average accumulated expenditures? This is the average that I spent. And then the next question becomes, what's the interest rate? That's what you have to capitalize. You get it? So you're doing construction on a building. You're doing construction on a building. As of January 1st, I have $300,000 of debt outstanding to construct that building. This building is not yet placed in service. In July, I incur another $400,000 of cost that I'm going to put through a loan. I request, I, I literally take $400,000 of bills, I submit it to the bank, I say, I need to pay my contractors, can you give me $400,000 and increase my loan balance by that amount? So the bank says, you know, they, they look at the bills, they give you your $400,000. So for six out of 12 months, you have another $400,000 outstanding on that loan. On average, that means for the year, you had it about $200,000 for the year, okay? So your total related to that loan, related to the construction of that asset that you took out in loans for the year was $500,000. Make sense? So what's the interest rate that you're paying on that $500,000? You figure out what that interest rate was and that's what gets capitalized. Okay? So of course, for, unfortunately, the interest rate is not always that straightforward. But weighted average accumulated expenditures is how much did I have outstanding and for how much of the year did I have that, that amount outstanding. Okay? That's your weighted average accumulated expenditures. <clears throat> so, to determine what interest to capitalize. So, first thing, determine your average accumulated expenditures. So, look at, that's what we just did. Look at how much your loan, wa how much loans you took out and how much of the year those loans were outstanding. Okay? If you have <coughs> multiple buildings and some of it's placed in service and some of it isn't, this be in reality, this can become very confusing because you have to figure out what bills are related to the building that's not yet placed in service, right? Okay, so sometimes you may have loan amounts that are related to something that's placed in service. If you're doing construction on an asset and it's not yet placed in service, that's the only time you have to capitalize interest. Okay, so here you have to determine what your average accumulated expenditures were. So what did we spend, what loan draws did we take out on that building that was being constructed for the period? Then you have to capitalize the amount of interest, okay? And compare that with the actual interest incurred. So let's figure out what that means. So step one, again, if uh, you have to figure out how much you spent, if accumulated expenditures occur evenly throughout the period, then you take the total expenditures for the year and divide it by two. That just says it's, it's the average for the year. Okay? Otherwise, you have to time weight the expenditures, which is like what I showed you in the last example. So again, this is the same example. So here, we're just time weighting them. So if, if we said we had, we incurred 700,000 evenly throughout the year, okay, then you'd have to just, you just take the total and divide it by two. Okay? Step two, calculate the amount of interest to capitalize. So here, you have to figure out what the interest rate is that's in effect. Okay? This w normally would be, this would be very simple if you took out a construction loan for the asset that you have not yet placed in service and you simply have a rate of interest. The problem is, is that sometimes you have a loan that you take out for this purpose, but you, you know, the, you have, let's say you take out a million dollars, but you're up to spending three million dollars. So now that debt's coming from other loans. Okay, so you have to look at what your average interest rate is over all your loans um, in many cases. So you, the interest rate is not so straightforward. So <clears throat> what does that mean? I'm sure I'm confusing you. So a specific interest method. The first thing you need to do, it's, which is very simple, you figure out your average accumulated expenditures. How much did I spend? Okay, and then you say, what's the interest rate in effect? So if you have a construction loan specifically for that project, just look at what the interest rate is for that project. That's very simple. That's your specific interest method. Beyond that, if you have more debt than is allocated to that loan, now you have to take the weighted average rate of all of your other loans that you have outstanding. So the first thing you have to do, very simply, 
is look at what the interest rate is. So if I have a construction loan for a specific project and the loan is for, you know, whatever that amount that that loan is for, I look at what the interest rate is in effect and that's the first interest rate that I'm going to use. But if I have more debt than that outstanding and the asset is not yet placed in service, I then have to take the weighted average rate of all of the rest of my debt. So here, if I have, this is for the weighted average rate. Specific interest is very simple, just you take the interest rate in effect. For the weighted average rate, if you have a 12% two-year note, <coughs> a 9% 10-year bond, you have a 7.5% 20-year bond, and this is the principal that you have outstanding on those loans, you figure out that on a $600,000 bond, 12% interest is $72,000. Okay? You say on a, a $2 million bond at 9%, the annual interest is $180,000. On a 7.5% uh, $5 million bond, the annual interest is $375,000. So you say my total interest for the year for all of my debts outside of the one that's specifically related to this loan, specific, specifically related to this, uh, this project, is 627,000 and my total principal on those loans is 7.6 million. So that says on all of my debt outside of the one that I'm specifically, I specifically took out for this construction loan, the average interest rate of my debt is 8.25%. Okay? So what you would do is you start off always looking at the specific loan that you've taken out for that project and you use that rate. If you have debt over and above the amount of that loan, then you have to take the average rate on the rest of your debt. Okay? And that becomes your weighted average rate that you use for the rest of your, um, for the rest of your debt that on the asset not yet placed in service. Okay? Um, let's look at an example. I'm sure this is confusing you. So let's look at an example and make some sense of this. This is a lot easier. I don't know why I'm having trouble explaining it right now. I'm usually very good at explaining this. So let's just try this and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Let's look at brief exercise. We're going to look at three brief exercises. Brief exercise 10-2. 10-3 and 10-4. Brief exercise 10-2, 10-3, and 10-4. Let's take a look at, with this, at, uh, at how to determine the interest to capitalize. What did I just do here? Wait a second. I think I 